Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by, and welcome to the PTC 2021 First Quarter Conference Call. During today's presentation, all parties will be in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, the conference will be open for questions. I would now like to turn the call over to Tim Fox, PTC Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining PTC's conference call to discuss first quarter 2021 financial results and the outlook for the remainder of the fiscal year. On the call today are Jim Heppelman, Chief Executive Officer, and Christian Tavaltia, Chief Financial Officer. Before we get started, please note that today's comments include forward-looking statements, including statements regarding future financial guidance. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, and involve factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by such statements. Additional information concerning these factors is contained in PTC's filings with the SEC, including our annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly reports on Form 10-Q. As a reminder, we will be referring to operating and non-GAAP financial measures today on today's call. Discussion of our operating metrics and the items excluded from our non-GAAP financial measures and a reconciliation between GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures are included in our earnings press release and related Form 8K. References to growth rates will be in constant currency unless otherwise noted. And lastly, we'll be referencing our earnings presentation, which you can find posted on our IR website. With that, I'd like to turn the call over to Jim. Thanks, Tim. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I hope that you and your families continue to stay safe and well during this ongoing pandemic. Before jumping into our quarterly review, I'd like to begin by discussing the news we shared two weeks ago about closing the ARENA acquisition and some related organizational changes. Turning to slide four in the deck, first, we're very pleased to have closed the acquisition and would like to formally welcome the ARENA employees to the PTC team. As we discussed at our recent Investor Day, we're excited to complement the strong momentum we have with Creo and Winchell in the traditional CAD and PLM market with the leading CAD and PLM solutions in the pure SaaS market. Together, Arena and Onshape represent a powerful pure SaaS solution that's number one in technology, customers, and revenue. With this combo, we're positioned to capture the rapidly emerging shift towards SaaS for product development, manufacturing, and support. There's clear evidence that the global pandemic has been driving a new normal in our industry, and we're now in a position to lead the product development market well into the future. We also announced an organization strategy that I'm excited about. We're expanding our SaaS business unit, initially built around Onshape and Vuforia, to embrace ARENA as well. This will put us in position to pursue technology, business process, and revenue synergies across this SaaS portfolio. The expanded business unit, which now accounts for about 100 million of ARR and about 20% of PTC's bookings, will be led by longtime PTC leader Mike DiTullio. Mike will focus on integrating the ARENA team and leveraging the tremendous talent and expertise we have across our SaaS portfolio. With his proven track record of aligning organizations to drive growth, I'm confident that in this new role, Mike can help us fully capitalize on our SaaS leadership position. I'm also pleased to announce that Jamie Pappas will succeed Mike as head of global sales, reporting to our chief operating officer, Troy Richardson. Jamie is an accomplished 25-year PTC sales veteran, and he has led regional sales in Asia, Europe, and most recently in North America. Jamie has a tremendous track record of success at PTC, so I'm confident in a smooth transition as he assumes his new role. With that, I'd like to turn to slide five and review the three key elements of our strategy to deliver long-term shareholder value. First, let's cover the topic of market demand. We had outstanding bookings results in the first quarter, up more than 30% year over year versus a fiscal Q1 of last year that was largely unaffected by the pandemic. The bookings helped the Q1 results, but they also beefed up the future backlog. 
we see the booking strength as reflecting a continuation of the secular demand trends we experienced in fiscal 20 as customers accelerated their digital transformation initiatives in response to the new way of doing business. Industrial companies are prioritizing initiatives like moving all product lifecycle processes online across their entire enterprise with PLM, remotely monitoring their products in factories with IoT, bringing digital productivity to their frontline production workers with AR, and they're generally getting more and more interested in SaaS as they go forward. For PTC, this all translates into more demand for our unique product portfolio, and we see a strong pipeline heading into the balance of the fiscal year. Given that the global PMI number reached its highest point in three years in December, we also believe PTC's strong Q1 bookings may have reflected improved customer optimism around promising vaccine news, stimulus policies of the new administration in Washington, and perhaps even some calendar year-end budget flush. We hope that optimization or optimism continues, but with mixed news related to the global pandemic, including concerns about new strains of the virus, we're not sure that we're out of the woods yet, and we continue to think that our outlook for the year is prudent. In the top line category, a combination of strong bookings and lower than expected churn translated into a very strong quarter with ARR growth of 16% or 12% in constant currency. This was at the high end of our guidance range and was driven by continued momentum in our core business and solid performance in the growth business. Revenue growth of 20% was well above guidance, resulting from strong large deal activity in the quarter. In the bottom line category, we delivered strong free cash flow of $111 million and non-GAAP EPS growth of 70%, reflecting a combination of strong top-line results combined with continued operating expense discipline. In the wake of this strong first quarter, we are increasing our guidance for the year, and Christian will share the details later in the call. With that as context, let's take a look at the respective contributions of the FSG, core, and growth segments of our portfolio. Moving to slide six, you'll see that ARR in our focus solution group, or FSG, was flat year over year. But ARR growth was robust in our much larger core business once again, and the mid-20s growth performance of our growth business tracked to our guidance for the year. You might note visually that the growth business has now reached roughly the same magnitude as FSG, and with ARENA coming into the picture, it will soon step up about 30%, and then with its higher growth rates, it'll soon become much larger, driving the combined portfolio toward higher growth rates as well. Recall that our FSG segment has exposure to certain industries heavily impacted by the pandemic, like retail and airline industries. However, our FSG products remain important and are very competitive, and we continue to expect FSG to recover to low single-digit ARR growth in fiscal 21 as economic conditions improve. We've seen some good progress in retail already, but as you know, the airline business remains difficult for everybody. Naturally, we're very pleased about the 12% ARR growth of our core business, which materially outpaced the market growth again. Q1 was the 13th consecutive quarter that our core business ARR growth rate has been in double digits. As Jay Leeshower pointed out in a recent report, PTC has of late enjoyed the number one growth rate in the traditional CAD industry with Creo, and our windshield business has been doing even better. Meanwhile, our growth business had another strong quarter with year-over-year -year bookings growth of nearly 40%, and delivered ARR growth in the mid-20s in line with our guidance for the year. Let's go a click deeper into the main elements of our core and growth segments. Turning to slide seven, our Creo CAD team delivered another impressive quarter with ARR growth in the high single digits. The improvement in the demand environment that we started to see in Q4 continued this past quarter with strong performance across all major geos. And in a market that tends to see very little replacement activity, 
we had some notable CAD competitive displacements, which speaks to the technological strength of the Creo product suite. Our CAD technology leadership was further extended with the latest release of Creo 7, which incorporates our first Atlas-based offering, Creo Generative Design Extension, or GDX as we call it, leverages the Frustum Generative Design Engine acquired in 2019, with the compute being offloaded to an Atlas Pure SaaS Elastic Computing Environment from where it's served to Creo Sessions now and soon to Onshape Sessions as well. We also released the high fidelity mainstream simulation capabilities of ANSYS fully integrated into Creo, creating another highly differentiated leg of growth for our CAD business. Speaking of ANSYS, on slide eight, we highlight a great Creo and Creo Simulation Live, or CSL win, with Shark Ninja. Shark Ninja is becoming a household name, and to respond to the growing demand for its products in a very competitive space, Shark Ninja reevaluated its design technology and decided to phase out competitive CAD systems and standardize on Creo, adding CSL to help accelerate their new product development cycle times. Moving on to slide nine in our PLM business, you'll see that PLM continued to deliver very strong performance with another mid-teens ARR growth quarter. From a geographic perspective in Q1, PLM performance was broad-based with double-digit growth across all three major geographies, led again by the APAC region. Thanks to its key role in digital transformation initiatives, PLM continues to be a major growth engine for PTC. From a vertical perspective, our PLM team continues to win big in the medical device space, but market traction in the first quarter was strong across a number of verticals, including automotive, aerospace and defense, and high tech. Turning to slide 10, a great proof point in A&D was a major extension and expansion at Airbus, which also happened to include a competitive displacement in one of their divisions. Along with the windshell footprint expansion, Airbus adopted ThingWorks and Vuforia in their manufacturing environment, which is another great example of the cross-sell opportunity within our product portfolio. Given today's difficult air transportation market, airframe companies are being careful with spending, but thanks to this deal, PTC is locked into a substantial long-term relationship with Airbus. You'll see on slide 11 that we had a great cloud-based wind chill win at Terumo in the medical device space. Terumo is replacing its paper-based FDA compliance system with an end-to-end -end digital thread based on wind chill's quality management solution. Moving on to our growth segment, I'll begin with IoT on slide 12. Following strong bookings performance in Q4, IoT had a solid start to the year with a promising uptick in new logo bookings, an area that was pressured over the last year due to travel restrictions and lockdowns. Demand was broad-based across verticals, and we had some sizable expansion deals in the process manufacturing space, which is greenfield for PTC. With a strong pipeline and encouraging signs of churn improvement in IoT as well, we expect to see continued solid ARR growth in fiscal 21. On slide 13, we have an example of ThingWorks in the process manufacturing space at Griffin Foods. Operating in a market that has relatively thin margins, Griffin Foods was looking for ways to accelerate efficiencies in its production environment. Leveraging the ThingWorks Smart Connected Operations, or SCO, solution, they are digitizing their production lines to capture key performance data and display it in a unified view to allow managers to see problems and make faster, more informed decisions on the plant floor. Let me shift to our AR business on slide 14. The Vuforia Augmented Reality Team again delivered very strong results in Q1, with bookings up 80% year over year. Expansions drove over 50% of bookings in the quarter, with three deals greater than 500K, which was a new record for the AR team. Traction outside the Americas continued to gain momentum with strong growth in both Europe and APAC. Let me share two examples that highlight the value of our broader AR suite. First, on slide 15, is at Bid Group, 
one of the largest integrated suppliers in the wood processing industry. The bid group replaced a do-it-yourself or DIY approach for industrial IoT and then added Vuforia chalk to the mix to improve workforce productivity while reducing travel costs. Turning to slide 16, a second great AR success story is Royal Enfield, the world's oldest motorcycle brand. As the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded, Royal Enfield was forced to reimagine a planned physical event for launching a new motorcycle. Leveraging Vuforia Studio in under a month, they built a dynamic sales training capability and delivered this highly effective, interactive, augmented reality experience to more than 3,000 remote participants. Turning now to slide 17, I'll wrap up my comments on our growth business by discussing Onshape, which also delivered a very strong quarter. Onshape had record bookings, up more than 150% from its initial quarter at PTC one year ago, including a nice balance of new logo activity and expansions. Onshape's pure SaaS CAD solution is quickly becoming a disruptive force in the SMB space, shaking up a mature market segment where PTC has been underrepresented for years. I'd like to update you on the exciting trends we're seeing in the education market with Onshape. As the COVID pandemic unfolded, we saw a real opportunity to help schools and universities because we have the only true school from home CAD solution that works on any device with no installed footprint. PTC's academic team decided to pivot their focus to Onshape and set an aggressive goal to try to reach 1 million total education users by the end of fiscal 21. To put that in perspective, it's double the number of users that were participating in our education program across all PTC products at that time. I'm happy to report that already in January, we've exceeded the goal of 1 million total Onshape education users, nine months ahead of schedule. Onshape is quickly becoming the education standard thanks to one of the greatest share shifts I've experienced. Students and teachers love it. Clearly, we caught a wave as world events and the changing needs in education have accelerated this achievement. It's been incredibly rewarding to see how many educators and students have been able to take advantage of Onshape. Students who would not normally have access to CAD are now able to engage in STEM classes. Robotics teams are able to compete even when their season is canceled, and educators have been able to seamlessly continue their instruction because of their access to Onshape. On slide 18, we highlight one of the many school systems supporting their K-12 STEM education program by adopting Onshape, in this case across the Charlottesville City School System. Gaining one million student users is a huge milestone with significant implications for PTC well into the future. Manufacturing companies have the very same needs for real-time collaboration and access to data from anywhere and on any device. I continue to think the COVID crisis is accelerating the SaaS tipping point for the engineering software industry by several years. On slide 19, you'll see a great example of a commercial company, Sterling Ultracold, doing the same thing. They're adopting Onshape to streamline communication between mechanical designers, supply chain managers, manufacturing, and quality assurance teams to avoid the delays associated with sending CAD data back and forth by email like they used to do. To wrap up on our growth business, I think it's pretty clear that our solutions are uniquely positioned to help customers respond to the new normal they're facing today, and they provide a very strong foundation for long-term growth for PTC. Let me provide some color on geographic performance, which was strong across the globe. On slide 20, you'll see that APAC had strong performance with ARR growth of 16%, reflecting the earlier reopening of those economies, and much improved churn rates as our subscription licensing model gains increased acceptance. America's ARR growth of 13% was the second quarter in a row of double-digit growth, driven by broad-based demand across our core and growth segments, but partially offset by softness in FSG. Europe ARR growth of 8% faced a tough year-over-year -year comparison, but delivered very strong bookings performance in both our core and growth segments, along with some notable competitive wins. With that, now let me turn to slide 21 and touch on our key alliance partners. 
The Microsoft partnership had another strong quarter, delivering above plan for the third consecutive <coughs> quarter and exceeding expectations in all geos. As you saw in their earnings release yesterday, Microsoft has a lot of momentum, and we're drafting behind it. With a solid pipeline and field engagement strengthening across the globe, we remain bullish on the Microsoft Alliance opportunity. Rockwell delivered over 20 expansion deals and had transactions in 27 countries. The majority of Rockwell's deals continue to come from customers that are greenfield to PTC and in process industries that we have not traditionally targeted with our core products. I was pleased to see in their earnings release that Rockwell, too, is seeing a strong uptick in orders. If you follow Rockwell, you may be aware that they have reorganized to have a software-focused business unit that owns the PTC partnership, and yesterday they announced that they have hired Brian Shepard to head up that unit. Brian worked directly for me at PTC for a dozen years, so I know that Rockwell's found a very capable software leader and somebody who can help the PTC-Rockwell relationship unleash its fullest potential. Congratulations to Brian. We're looking forward to working with him. Lastly, on the Alliance front, our ANSYS-powered solutions had a solid quarter with 20% bookings growth and very healthy expansion activity that drove around half of Q1 bookings. To complement CSL in the market, we launched the broader and deeper <coughs> Creo ANSYS simulation suite. We're expecting these ANSYS-powered solutions to account for high single-digit percentage of our new CAD ACV in fiscal 21. Before I wrap up, I'd like to highlight a great win we had with Microsoft on slide 22. The Colroot Group was looking for an IoT platform to support a complete digital transformation of their shops, food production, energy production, and logistics. Microsoft received an RFP in a competitive bid process and turned to PTC to partner on the opportunity. We ultimately won together, resulting in a multi-phase hybrid cloud IIoT project. To wrap up and summarize my comments, turning to slide 23, we're off to a great start in fiscal 21 as customers continue to embark on digital transformation initiatives that leverage our full product portfolio. We had strong bookings in the quarter, and churn performance was good as well. We delivered ARR at the high end of guidance while adding to the backlog. We saw a great performance in core and growth segments and in our channel. The demand environment appears to be improving globally, and our strategic alliances continue to grow and mature. Plus, with the ARENA team joining forces with Onshape, PTC is now positioned as the number one leader in SaaS-based CAD and PLM, and along with Vuforia, this sizable pure SaaS portfolio is paving the way toward an attractive, future-proof business model for PTC. As Christian will detail shortly, we're pleased to be raising our Fiscal 21 guidance in recognition of solid execution that demonstrates our capability to deliver strong top-line growth, margin expansion, and free cash flow generation, the necessary ingredients to drive significant shareholder value for years to come. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Christian, to take us through more details on the financial results and guidance. Thanks, Jim, and good afternoon, everyone. Before I review our results, I'd like to note that I'll be discussing non-GAAP results and guidance, and all growth rate references will be in constant currency. Let me start off with a brief review of our first quarter results, then spend the balance of the call on our revised outlook for fiscal 21. Turning to slide 25, fiscal Q1 ARR of $1.34 billion increased 12% year over year. As Jim noted earlier, we had very strong bookings performance in Q1, resulting in new ACV above expectations, and consistent with recent trends, demand for ramp deals was strong, which contributes to backlog in future periods, primarily fiscal 22 and beyond. With solid new ACV results, along with churn coming in better than expected, we were pleased to deliver constant currency ARR growth at the high end of the guidance range. Reported ARR growth of 16% benefited from 400 basis points of currency, uh, including a 200 basis point tailwind since the beginning of fiscal 21. Strong Q1 free cash flow of 111 million 
was a record Q1 result for PTC. <coughs> Q1 revenue of $429 million increased 20% year over year and was well above the uh, annual guidance range we had provided last quarter. Revenue performance was driven by very strong large deal uh, results in the quarter, many of which had long contract duration. As we've discussed previously, revenue is impacted by ASC 606, which in the case of Q1 drove a higher amount of, higher amount of upfront subscription revenue recognized in the quarter. Uh, currency was also a modest revenue tailwind. <clears throat> the strong revenue growth, along with continued financial discipline, resulted in non-GAAP EPS growth of 70% year over year. Turning to page 26, I'll begin with our balance sheet. We ended Q1 with cash of $399 million and $1 billion of gross debt with an aggregate interest rate of 3.8%. Subsequent to the first quarter, we financed the ARENA acquisition with $600 million from our revolving credit facility and cash on hand. From a use of cash standpoint, we plan first to pay down the revolver until we're below our three uh, times debt to EBITDA uh, ratio target, which should be within the next couple of quarters. Over the medium term, we expect to continue to delever while also resuming share repurchases. Now turning to guidance, I'll begin on slide 27 by highlighting a few of the key guidance assumptions. We continue to expect the macro environment to remain stable in the near term with conditions improving in the second half of the fiscal year. And with this as context, we're also still expecting fiscal 21 bookings growth in the double digits on a year-over-year -year basis. Given our strong Q1 performance, we're raising the low end of our organic ARR growth from 9% to 10%, resulting in a range of 10% to 12% uh, growth for the fiscal year. We're expecting ARENA to add approximately 400 basis points of ARR growth and currency to add approximately 200 basis points of ARR uh, growth relative to our previous, previous guidance. Regarding ARR in fiscal 21, on a constant currency basis, we continue to expect growth rates to be fairly linear uh, each quarter throughout, fiscal, throughout the fiscal year. Now for the specifics. Turning to slide 28, we're expecting fiscal 21 ARR of 1.47 to 1.5 billion. That's a growth rate of 16 to 18 percent. Free cash flow is still expected to be approximately 340 million for the full year, which is growth of approximately 60 percent year over year. Note that currency is also benefiting free cash flow by about 15 million. However, this benefit is being offset by an unforecasted foreign tax assessment related to a matter that's been open for a few years. Uh, this tax matter is also reflected in our GAAP results. As you'll note, a $35 million charge that covers the periods from 2011 uh, to 2020. This charge reflects a previous assessment paid in 2016 as well as the current expected assessment. We continue to believe that our position is correct and are fighting this issue in court, uh, and we do not expect a final resolution on the matter for at least another year. Our $340 million free cash flow target also includes approximately $15 million of acquisition-related fees and an additional $5 million of incremental interest we expect to pay this year due to the debt we took on uh, to help finance the ARENA acquisition. And as a reminder, fiscal 21 free cash flow also includes approximately 15 million of restructuring payments related to primarily to the headquarters relocation, uh, as well as to cost actions we took uh, early in fiscal 20, that's early last year. Regarding the linearity of free cash flow in fiscal 21, we still expect to generate uh, more than 60% of our annual free cash flow in the first half as collections are stronger in the first half, and this is offset by expenses increasing as we ramp hiring throughout the year. 
now turning to P&L guidance. We're raising our revenue and EPS guidance for the year. We're now expecting fiscal 21 revenue of 1.69 to 1.73 billion. That's a growth rate of 16 to 19 percent. And the increased revenue guidance is really driven by three main factors. First, uh, the strong large deal activity uh, and longer than anticipated contract durations that we saw in Q1, uh, which, as we've mentioned before, because of ASC 606, is driving higher upfront revenue recognition. Uh, this ultimately is contributing about 400 basis points of growth. Uh, as a reminder, this change has no impact on ARR or free cash flow as we continue to bill customers annually up front. Second, the ARENA acquisition, which will add approximately 300 basis points of growth. And lastly, uh, FX or currency, which should add approximately 200 basis points of growth relative to our prior guidance. On the expense front, we're now expecting operating expense growth of approximately 16% in fiscal 21. This is an increase of approximately 600 basis points. Uh, half of the increase is related to the arena acquisition and half uh, related to currency. Non-GAAP EPS is now expected to be $3.05 to $3.25, uh, which is growth of 19 to 26%. I'd also note here that GAAP guidance does not include the impact of Arena Solutions purchase accounting as the valuation of acquired assets and liabilities uh, work has not yet been completed. Wrapping up, we had strong financial performance again here in Q1. We delivered double-digit ARR growth while maintaining discipline on our expense structure and continue to navigate in a very challenging macro environment. The strong start to the year positions us well to deliver attractive double-digit top-line growth and very strong free cash flow. With that, uh, I'll turn the call over to the operator and we can begin Q&A. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, simply press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press at the pound key. And please limit yourself to one question only. If you have additional questions, please return to the queue. Our first question is from Jay Deshauer with Griffin Securities. Your question, please. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, Jim, let me uh, start with a uh, technology question for you having to do with the uh, ARENA acquisition. Um, with that, you now arguably have uh, three code bases for PLM, uh, ARENA, Windchill, and, uh, and Onshape. Um, that's not unprecedented in the industry, as you know, as a result of acquisitions in, in uh, technical software. But could you talk about how you're thinking about uh, the, the co-development or the conjoining uh, of those technologies, uh, particularly given the ultimate objective you seem to have had with Atlas of having a microservices architecture, for example. And then for Christian, uh, at the analyst meeting, you put up a very interesting slide on your customer engagement model showing uh, seven uh, categories of customer uh, that I don't think you've shown before. How does your guidance uh, encompass your, uh, your thinking about those various categories in terms of growth and contribution to uh, Fiscal 21? Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Jay. Well, Christian, you can start thinking about the answer to that while I, uh, while I get this <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a good observation. I mean, uh, we had Windchill, then we acquired Onshape, and there were two different things, and now we acquired Arena. So yes, in fact, we have three. But uh, actually, we do have a very uh, well-understood strategy. So, so first of all, um, we will begin the process of uh, looking at the best ways for uh, Arena to use more and more of the Atlas platform that came to us with Onshape. And, to be frank, uh, Arena and, uh, and Onshape don't do exactly the same things. You know, Onshape's more like uh, file management, except not really files, but more like data management and collaboration. And, uh, and Onshape's more like bill of material. So those 
two things do different things, but they will over time share more and more of a common architecture uh, called Atlas. So then that still leaves Windchill. Um, so we have shared kind of a, a midterm project that we are developing versions of Windchill and Creo that will use the Atlas platform to a great extent so that they can be delivered in a SaaS model, but those products will retain full upward compatibility from the on-premise versions that exist today. Um, now, we'll continue to maintain an on-premise version. So you might say we're going from three to two to one and a half or something like that. Um, but there's a good, a good uh, strategy here for how this stuff evolves. And you know, none of it's going to be a revolution because we're bringing all the customers with. But I definitely think this is a problem that um, will fade away. And you know, we've done that before. Um, it's a problem that I'm not even sure it's a problem, but it's a situation that will be, uh, you know, that will evolve over time toward a cleaner kind of steady state in the end. Christian? Yeah, great. <clears throat> Jace, I, I think what you're referring to is that uh, S1 to, you know, S6 uh, uh, customer engagement model. You know, I mean, I think here c conceptually the right way to think about it is, uh, you know, the largest piece of our ARR uh, really comes from uh, S1, uh, the S1 and S2 space. Uh, that's also actually where we still see a significant amount of uh, new booking activity. Uh, you know, those are our largest and, and uh, <clears throat> customers with, with the biggest growth prospects. Uh, we have a lot of stable ARR in kind of the S3 and S4 space. And the new, uh, really the, the, the land and expand activity happens primarily within uh, the, the S5 and S6 space. And so, you know, I mean, if I was going to think about this, I'd still put the, the largest chunk up in, up in S1 and S2. Uh, we're seeing a lot of momentum in the uh, S5 and S6. You know, Tim, uh, or we, we actually mentioned in the, on the call uh, that we've seen a little bit of a resurgence in new IoT customers coming back in, uh, the channel. Uh, which also operates in kind of the S5, S6, and, and, the, and, and the channel space, uh, continues to bring in uh, new customers. That's obviously also where think, relationships like Rockwell are, uh, who also continue to bring in a lot of new Greenfield uh, customers, which are the foundation really for us to continue to expand upon those relationships over time. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. but let, let me add some color that I think is a easier way to see it. Um, I think if you look at it by product, you get a different story because uh, the size, the relatively larger size of some products kind of overwhelms that story. But uh, Arena and Onshape are all about new accounts. They're basically competing in a space where we didn't previously have products competing. So there, there are almost entirely new accounts. Um, if you go to IoT and AR, that's kind of 50-50 because uh, those are products we can sell to our uh, traditional accounts, but of course, there's a lot of demand and interest in IoT and AR, and we have new partners like Rockwell that, that also take us to a lot of new places. And then if you go back to Creo and Windshell, I mean, that would be majority of the bookings coming from companies we've been doing business with, but sometimes we, we knock one off or there's a consolidation play or, or something like that, and, and as well, the channel is bringing in some new accounts. So I think it's almost all new for Onshape and, uh, and Arena roughly half and half-ish for uh, IoT and AR, and sort of majority, maybe 70-30, uh, in favor of install base with Grill and Winchell. Sound all right? Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Adam Ward with Cecil. Your question, please. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hey, guys, and uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, maybe just two real quick. Um, first on Arena, um, could you just remind us on Arena's kind of international footprint and what's the plans to kind of expand that both direct and via channel? And then maybe two just on ANSYS. So thanks for the color of how you're thinking about uh, Creo Simulation Live and Creo Simulation growth over the back half of the year. But, but when you think more broadly, how, how addressable is the Creo Simulation technology to your broader install base? Um, thanks for that. Yeah, um, so... Uh, let me say uh, on your first question, Arena. Arena is predominantly a U.S. business. Um, it's it's been almost for 
to, to a very great degree sold to American companies, although some American companies have users overseas. But it hasn't really been sold to companies overseas, uh, with just a small, small exception. Um, so the first thing we're going to do with Arena, for sure, is go international with it. I mean, that's a, that's a good piece of uh, growth we ought to be able to go after as a synergy. And then, of course, cross-selling between Onshape and Arena ought to produce another synergy. And, and I think uh, our channel ought to produce yet another synergy. So I'm sort of of the opinion that um, there's a lot of upside to Arena, if not this year, certainly in the coming years, as we, uh, we can take this, this business places that Arena themselves couldn't have gone so easily. Um, so that's maybe the first part. Uh, then second on ANSYS, if I remember, we had quantified um, that we thought there was a $100 million potential opportunity with Creo Simulation Live in our base. Um, I think that's before, I don't know, Tim, did that include the, uh, the mainstream simulation products? Yeah. No, so I, I haven't quantified that, but, uh, you know, well more than $100 million because the, uh, the rest of the ANSYS suite actually comes at a, at a higher price point. We probably get less penetration because some of them might already have purchased it from ANSYS or, or one of their uh, distributors. But um, certainly, certainly $100 million would be the floor in terms of opportunity. You know, will we ever get 100% of that? No. But, um, you know, it certainly, certainly is a sizable uh, ARR opportunity for us. Great. Thanks again. Thank you. Our next question comes from Rich Valera with Needham. Your question, please. Hey, Rich. Thank you. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Um, first, just a quick follow-up on that ANSYS question. I know you have the target of high single-digit percentage of, of new CAT ACV for this year. Can you say where it was uh, last year, just so we have some perspective on how much growth that was? And then for the IoT products, um, Sounds like a solid performance this quarter, but I know last quarter you talked about bookings doubling quarter over quarter. I'm just wondering if you can give us any sense of the kind of quarter over quarter momentum you saw in that business from Q4 to Q1. Thank you. Um, you do, do you have a quantification, Christian, on the uh, the size Antis would have been in terms of new ACV within CAD last year? Nominal. Nominal. Uh, would have, I mean, it would have been some because we had some initial sales. We'll, we'll get it, but I mean, it was not. Yeah, well, it would have been low single digits. So think that we're going from low single digits to high single digits would be our aspiration here. Um, Got it. That's helpful. And, and then on the Q4 to Q1, um, Q, Q1 IoT uh, bookings didn't have the same growth rate that they had in Q4, but again, it was a healthy number. I mean, in, in Q4, it was a very healthy number. And, uh, and in both cases, a lot of that went into backlog. So um, you're seeing a situation where uh, the, the backlog deficit we started this year with, you know, had a fairly good representation in IoT, and that's slowing down our IoT growth rate. And some of the goodness that we're bringing in with new bookings is going into backlog and will help next year, but it isn't necessarily coming, overcoming the deficit we started the year with. So anyway, we're still on plan, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a bad thing, but um, putting more... Uh, more bookings in the backlog for next year and the year after is a, is a good thing. That makes sense. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Sterling Audi with J.P. Morgan. Your question, please. Hey, guys. It's Jack and Ader on for Sterling tonight. Um, thanks for taking our questions. First one is a follow-up on, on the IoT bookings and, and kind of a good start to the year. Any particular verticals that, that really stuck out um, and maybe verticals that, that performed well outside of the Rockwell channel for IoT? Yeah, you know, we, uh, we looked at that data, Jack, and uh, it, it really was pretty broad representation. Um, Tim and I were studying that data, and nothing really jumps out. It's sort of a little bit everywhere in more or less the percentage we kind of normally have. So broad-based is how I would uh, characterize that. Okay, um, and then another another bookings question and vertical question, really on 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 shape. Um, you know, if we think about the you know up well over 150 percent from bookings, what if we stripped out you know education? You know, how what kind of mixes are the bookings coming from education yeah. versus so non-education? That's an easy one, Jack, because you don't have to strip it out. We've not been charging educational institutions for the software. Um, however, oh. however. 
we had a program that you can use it for free for the first year. So um, we do anticipate that as this school year wraps up and we move into next year, we're going to get a pretty decent conversion rate to paid. Um, but in that, in that good news that we have so far, it's all commercial sales. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sakit Kalia with Barclays. Your question, please. Hey guys, thanks for taking my. Hey Tim, hey J uh, Jim and Christian, thanks for taking my question here. I'll just keep it to one. Um, Jim, may maybe for you, you know, I think the business that surprised us all last year, and 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 I think continues to do here in Q1 is, is the performance in PLM. You know, maybe the question is, how much of this do you think is from, you know, maybe an industry-wide refresh? Right, that that's maybe coming from just more digital transformation, if you as you've sort of hinted at before, versus market share gains. Well, um, I, I mean, first of all, I do think there are some real strong market share gains. Um, you know, I don't think other vendors are performing at the same level as we have been, and, and it's been a long time since any of you guys asked me if Eris was disrupting us. We kind of haven't heard that name in ages, uh, so I think they're losing some real momentum. So I think it it really is. Uh, more companies are realizing that they need, if they have PLM, they need to have it more broadly and more people need to use it. You know, like maybe, maybe the procurement guy could walk down the hall and talk to the engineers, but now that he's working from home, he can't, and so he needs a seat. So I think some of it is existing companies broadening and deepening their implementation. And then I think there's a lot of companies who, uh, like the Turumo example we gave, who uh, was doing their FDA compliance, you know, literally on paper, saying, okay, that's not going to work. We need to get a PLM system. We need to get it fast. So I think there's a lot of companies whose appreciation of PLM has deepened greatly um, in the last couple of years, first for digital transformation in general and then for COVID requiring it. And I think that of those companies who uh, get religion around PLM, we're certainly knocking down more than our fair share. That's how I would characterize that. Got it. That's very helpful. I'll hop back in queue. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Heck. Thank you. Our next question comes from Joe Rulink with Baird. Your question, please. Hey, Joe. Uh, hey, Joe. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll try to squeeze into one more near term. From the uh, the mid-December comments on ARR, the quarter definitely finished stronger than that communication. Is there any activity that came in at quarter end? Uh, I know you talked about maybe some year-end budget flush, but Anything else, you know, the, the fact that large deal signings seem to be working back into the mix where you would maybe point to quarter-end activity and think, you know, it, it perhaps is early, but these developments are new and maybe could be extrapolated into something changing. And then the, the second question, it, it kind of gets back to the PLM question that was just asked, but, you know, the, the verticals of high-tech, life sciences, aerospace and defense, these have been really strong for PTC pretty consistent, consistently, and, and now you're adding Arena, which is strong in those verticals as well. So is there something specifically about those markets and how they're viewing PLM that really has benefited the fact that PTC has good exposure there? Yeah, um, so uh, let's take the first one. Uh, our mid-December comments, uh, Christian said uh, he anticipated we'd be in the middle of the 9 to 12 range, and we came in at 12. So uh, I think, uh, you know, to be frank, what happened is we review the forecast every single week on Fridays, and we raised it four times in uh, December. So by the time we um, had that meeting with you, we had raised it once, but, you know, a couple of days later we raised it again and then twice more. So um, if you study the uh, PLM performance, as, as of course, we do, um, what you'd see is that it wasn't on the backs of any one geography or any one vertical or any one big deal. It was just a lot of deals of all sizes in all geographies across a bunch of different verticals. I mean, it just felt like just good, solid business everywhere as opposed to, you know, some surprise. Um, I think uh, if, if, you, if you go to the verticals question you asked, um, I think Arena uh, is very strong in um, in high tech and very strong in general in SMB. Now, high tech does tend to have a lot of SMB customers, and the other thing about high tech is uh, product life cycles tend to be very short. You know, if you make triple uh, sevens like uh, like Boeing does, it's very hard to switch CAD systems because those products last for decades. 
But if you're making uh, consumer handheld devices, you know, the life on one of those things is pretty darn short. And the next version isn't based on the last version, so you can switch tools much more easily. So I think in general, electronics and high tech is a fast cycle market, and it's easier to get a share shift to happen there, which, which helps both Onshape and Arena, by the way. Um, now, PTC does well in the larger electronics and high-tech customers who probably are, are selling stuff that ends up in a rack in a data center and, and, and you know, big uh, machines that have a lot of electronics in them and so forth that aren't necessarily so short cycle and whatnot. Um, in the case of uh, aerospace and defense, I mean, uh, Arena does have some uh, aerospace and defense accounts that are generally small uh, suppliers to larger firms. Um, but I would say, you know, probably that's not, that's not necessarily the best spot to sell Arena, um, other than if you're low in the supply chain. And there are a lot of small suppliers in the aerospace and defense uh, supply chain, in part because the government encourages that. So I think Onshape and, uh, you know, we're also coming out with an ITAR version of Onshape for the same reason, uh, that these smaller, these smaller accounts need something and really just don't have the wherewithal for the bigger, heavier enterprise systems that the, that the you know, masters at the top of their supply chain would, would prefer. So I think, uh, maybe a long way of getting to the point, uh, Arena and Onshape are very complementary to uh, Creo and Windshell. They do the same thing, but they appeal to different segments of the market. And the low end of the market doesn't want the high end products, and the high end of the market today doesn't want the low end products. That, that may happen over time, but right now it's all, uh, it's all incremental upside as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Our next question comes from Matt Hedberg with RBC Capital Markets. Your question, please. Hey, Matt. Oh, hey, guys. Hey, Matt. hey guys. Hey, guys. Hey guys, good evening. Uh, congrats on a really strong quarter here in Q1, um, Jim. You know, I wanted to ask you a question about some of the CAD replacement deals. Obviously, those were really good to hear, and, and, and obviously difficult to pull off. I'm wondering if you could provide a few more details on, on what drove those, and, and, and thinking longer term with all your investments in SAS, CAD, and Atlas. I mean, do you think we might be in a scenario where you might see even more disruption in the future? Some of these some of these CAD replacements, considering what you've done with SAS versus some of your peers. Yeah, um, uh, so uh, there's, there's two in particular I'll, I'll talk about. One really was Shark Ninja, um, but let me, let me cover the other one first. It was a uh, European OEM. I, I, I can't tell you who it was. I will be able to at some point, but not yet. I don't yet have permission. But uh, an OEM who had uh, both our software, and our CAD software, and the competitors and used them both, as, as many large OEMs do. Um, and they decided that they didn't like that anymore, and they'd really prefer to have one tool, and if they had to go from two to one, they were going to Creo. Um, so that was a, a pretty substantial displacement of a very well-known high-end product. And then um, in the other case really was uh, a displacement of a very well-known low-end product, you know, where, where this account said, uh, Shark Ninja, said, you know, we really like what Creo can do. And we really like CSL and, and so forth, and, and we too don't like having two sets of tools. And if we had to pick one, we'd pick Creo. So kind of at op opposite ends of the Creo range, if you will, um, we're displacing different products from the same vendor. Um, and, uh, and that vendor, uh, you can guess who it is, you know, it has, has kind of left their customers a little frustrated. Uh, some of their business policies, some of their technical strategies, you know, aren't well accepted by the customers and is creating some discontent and some of that discontent turns into switching. You know, especially if you're looking at two tools and you're saying, I wish we had one, well, I really like those PTC guys. Their tools are great and they're better to work with and, uh, and off we go. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Our next question comes from Gal Munda with Berenberg. Your question, please. Hey, uh, yeah, thank you for taking my question. Um, Jim, I have a question for you in terms of the IoT. Uh, in the past, you've said that a lot of your IoT growth in the future will be obviously reliant on the partners and them bringing on incremental new opportunities, uh, mainly talking about Rockwell, obviously, um, also Microsoft. Uh, recently, uh, you know, a few days ago, you've announced a kind of a, a partnership with Fujitsu Smart Factory. Uh, on, on the on the um, kind of a IoT initiative, and I was just wondering how much 
how, how does that compare to something like Rockwell and how complementary it is versus how much is it is as a competitive channel to something like Rockwell as well, uh, which clearly isn't fully exclusive, but how does it work? Thank you. Yeah, the, I mean, there, there is no exclusivity there. Uh, what, what happened uh, with Fujitsu is, uh, as I understand the story, first they implemented our software in their factories, and uh, it was quite successful. And then there is a, a system integrator arm of Fujitsu who uh, said, we'd like to take this showcase we built in our own company and take it on the road and sell it to other companies. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's the nature of that announcement. But, you know, Fujitsu as an SI is no Rockwell. Um, so I, I don't really, I, I, they're much more localized in certain pockets and so forth. But, you know, an important partner and we're glad to have them. But uh, I don't think it's meaningful at the level of a Rockwell partnership, um, certainly not yet. Maybe we'll get there someday, but um, just think of them as two different tiers. Got you. But the idea is to really expand that channel partnership within the SIs to, to kind of broaden the adoption of that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of SIs want to sell with us um, mm -hmm. where we sell the software and they do the project, and, and that's a motion that's been working very well. Um, and then some uh, SIs you know, in, in some cases, like Fujitsu, say, "Well, could we just sell it? Because you know, we have some uh, we have some clients. We'd like to we'd like to go, basically, sell them what we've done in our own company, and we'd like to take that order." So, um, but think that for every Fujitsu, there's uh, multiple SIs that we sell with, rather than through. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question will be from Matthew Broom with Mitsuho Securities. Your question, please. Uh, thanks very much for Hi. Hi, hi Jim, Christian, and Tim. Um, thanks for squeezing me in. Um, so ju just in terms of the new uh, SaaS business unit, is that more of an operational structure, uh, or is it also responsible for driving future SaaS strategy, you know, including M&A and, and, and maybe the migration of, of your core products? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a business unit that's uh, quite complete. It has uh, R&D and marketing and sales. It uh, doesn't really do services because we don't so much need that. Um, but it's, it's really a pretty complete business unit. It has a P&L. It has growth targets. We will make acquisitions for them. In fact, Arena was an example, but we made a couple other little tuck-ins that we didn't announce because they were too small. Um, but definitely that's a business. And the way I look at it, they're paving the path for a future PTC, um, because at some point, uh, our industry will really go to SaaS. I mean, it's starting to, and that's good, but at some point, you know, it'll tip right over like uh, other industries have. And at that point, you know, uh, that business unit will be bigger and bigger and, you know, may, may in fact be the future uh, center of gravity for PTC. It, it's not big enough, you know, at, at uh, 100 million, that's 100 on, uh, you know, let's call it a billion four. So it's uh, it's not yet uh, 10%, but uh, you put Arena in there and it steps up closer to 10%, and then you let that growth rate run for a while, and uh, you know it won't be long before it's uh, it's quite meaningful to us. But um, that's what they're doing; they're paving the path for a future PTC. Okay, that that makes sense. And then uh, maybe just quickly, uh, could you give us any idea in terms of what um, the win rates are for Onshape versus uh, you know uh, the competition? Yeah, um, well, I think what it really comes down to is uh, does a customer want SaaS or not? Um, if they want SaaS, then the win rate's exceptionally high. But they might decide they don't want SaaS for whatever reason, and it might be that other people in their company already use SolidWorks or, or what have you. Um, but, but think of Onshape as uh, a really good CAD system on a completely different deployment and business model. And the deployment and business model um, you know, is is even more differentiated, uh, is more differentiated than the product itself is. Um, so I think smaller companies say, you know, I, I really like the idea of being able to get to this data without having a server, without having a system administrator, without having, you know, I like to be able to pick up my work at home on my Macintosh if I worked on it all day on a Windows workstation. I mean, that stuff's great. I like the real-time collaboration. You know, Onshape's a multi-user system. Uh, where multiple users work together on the same designs at the same time, as opposed to multiple users working independently and ha passing data back and forth, which is how uh, most other CAD systems work. So I think, again, um, 
I often say, think of it like electric vehicles versus internal combustion engines. It's religion at some level. And very few people get down to a short list that has uh, three of each. Um, somewhere in the decision-making process, they either say, I want electric, and now I'm down to a short list of electric vehicles, or I don't want electric, I'm going to stay with uh, internal combustion, and they end up with that short list. But I'm saying for those customers who say, I think I want SaaS, there's a good chance we're going to win that deal. Uh, thanks. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this ends our Q&A session. I will turn the call back to Tim Fox for final remarks. Thanks, Carmen, uh, and thank everybody for, for joining us today on the call. Uh, we'll be out on the road uh, virtually um, over the next quarter participating in a number of events. Um, please check out our website for details. Uh, and we do look forward to seeing you uh, this over the next coming months and certainly in 90 days. And thank you for your interest in PTC. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. And thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may